Surprise. Surprise. Man, worship team, great job. Melvin, way to lead them. Good job. Great job. Appreciate the highest attended Sunday being the Sunday that I'm preaching for the first time. Uh, yes. Your checks are all in the mail. <laughs> so, for those of you who are new here, you're wondering why is that so funny? I'm normally the worship pastor here, and uh, preaching is not my forte. Singing is. Uh, but so if I say something wrong theologically, just know that I was a music major, not a theology major. So we doing good this morning? Doing good. It's good to see all of y'all. I see some people like standing and stuff. Just let you guys know in the back, if there are some seats up here in the front, uh, not quite in the spit zone. So if y'all want to come up here, you're more than welcome to. It's a safe place to be. Okay, man. It's really good to see all of y'all. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sid was going to be uh, going on vacation, and he and I were talking in the office, and uh, he said, hey, I need to find someone to preach um, on July 7th, and uh, Hux will be wrapped up getting ready for camp, and, and uh, you know, Melvin's going to camp as well, and so like, could you reach out maybe to Rod Paget and see if he's available, and, and I said, yeah, we'll figure out something, and so I went back to my office, and I felt like the Holy Spirit just laid it on my heart that I was that someone uh, to speak. And uh, like every good worship pastor would do in that moment, I started to panic. Uh, and so I gave it 24 hours to know, was I actually hearing from the Holy Spirit or not? And so, uh, so the next day I went in and I sat down with Sid and I said, hey, what do you think about, about me possibly preaching on the seventh? And he said, you wanna preach? And I said, no, not at all. <laughs> like, no, but I feel like maybe I'm supposed to. And, uh, and so he said, yeah, man, if you want to give it a go, go for it, you know? And so, so I do feel like the Lord has laid something on my heart today to share, and I'm just going to share it, and uh, you guys do with it what, what you want, okay? I uh, hope that you'll use it. I hope that maybe it'll hit you uh, in your place of living right now, and that you'll be able to apply it to your life. Uh, so let's get started, okay? Uh, let's see how many of us have testimonies in this place. Uh, let's do a, a song game. Uh, if you'll finish the lyric... This will be for you Broadway people, okay? Let's see if you can get this. 525,600. Hey, testimonies everywhere. How about this one? If I could turn back. Yeah, sinners all over the room. Yes. A little share, yeah. How about this one? Uh, if you're lost, you can look and you will find me. More sinners over here than over here. Yeah, yeah. So a little Cindy Lopper there. I imagine we have some people that colored their hair back in the day and wore big dangly earrings. Some still do. Um, time is such a important part of our culture. We write songs about it. We have movies about it. And I believe time in some ways has created um, an impatience in us. And uh, maybe I'll just, and me, okay, maybe it's me, okay? Three weeks ago, our microwave went out in our house. And uh, do you know how long it takes to put something on the stove and heat it up now? <laughs> like, y'all who lived before microwaves were a thing, man, props, because it is inconvenient, okay? It's another dish you got to wash. I mean, it's, so I've been known over the last three weeks just to pull the macaroni and cheese right out and just eat it cold. Leftover tacos, cold. Uh, just, I, I don't got the time. I, you know, I'm impatient. So um, why is that? Why have we become so impatient? Listen, on my, when I'm driving, uh, this is where it really shows, okay? When I'm driving, for some reason in my mind, nobody should be in front of me. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm not the only one? Okay. So if for some reason you find yourself in front of me on the road... Uh, just know it's not going to last long, okay? I have created this game in my mind. It's a make-believe NASCAR game that I will make it in front of you. I will beat you to the finish line primarily because the finish line is always where I put it, which is always when I get in front of you. So time is so important. I think it's important because 
Once it's gone, it's gone. Once the hour is gone, you're never getting it back. Once the minute is gone, the second is gone, you're never getting it back. Okay, there's a lot of people in here, so let's see how many honest people we have. How many of you would say that you're a late person? Like, uh, not that you stay up late, but like, no matter what, you know, how hard you try, you're late. You're going to be late to your funeral. Raise them high, y'all. Come on, be proud. Be proud. Now, listen, y'all, we brought chairs in. Way more hands should be up. Y'all were late today to the second service. All right, keep them up. Let me see. Are you late? All right. All right, everybody. Now, let's talk to you on-time people. How many would say, I'm, on a, I'm an on-time person. Uh, if I'm on time, I'm actually late. I got to be early. Like, that's me. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. Keep them up. Keep them up. If you're on time, keep them up. Everybody that's on time, once you look around, those who don't have their hands up, you recognize them now, okay? <laughs> those are the late people. Hey, for you that are late people, I want to let you know that you bug the mess out of us on time people. You bug the mess out of us, okay? Hey, for you on time people, just to let you know, the late people think, the late people think that you're uptight. <laughs> you're not enjoying life enough, okay? <laughs> time is a big deal. Time is a big deal. If you will, turn your Bibles to, uh, to Mark chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 21. We'll go through 42. I really appreciate Sid giving me... Uh, so many verses to read in front of all these people. Um, but that's where we're going to be today. And uh, what I want us to talk about today, what I want us to kind of dive in on is, is how do we feel when it seems that God is late? How do we respond when we have a need, a request, an emergency, and Jesus just seems to be on mute or on pause, and we're not getting an answer? Sermon today is called God's Delay, God's Glory. I'm really glad y'all are here. Let's read the scripture together, okay? Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had crossed over again, I'm sorry, let me, let me say this real quick. Um, remember last week, right, Jesus cast out the demon, uh, the demons out of that guy, right? And that guy was like, hey, thanks a lot, I want to follow you. And he's like, no, go back to your family and tell them all the things that have happened, and he did and all that, right? And then a part of that was, you know, he cast the demons into the pigs, and the pigs all jumped off the cliff. We there? Remember? Okay? And then the people were like, hey, we have no more bacon. You got to go. So, so here we are. Jesus is now getting back into the boat to go back across where he came from. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat... To the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. Verse 22, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. Verse 25, a woman who had had an hemorrhage for 12 years, had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the, uh, in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garment, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed from her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garment? And his disciples said to him, uh, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and, and, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he told her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, the, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue of the official saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus overhearing what 
was being spoken said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one else to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And he entered in and he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately, they were completely astounded. And he gave them the strict orders that, that no one should know about this, and he, said to, and he said to give her something to eat. May God bless the reading of his word. Can we pray together? Father, we love you. God, would you be with me? Lord, help my voice to stay strong. God, help my mind to stay clear. And God, I just pray that you would help the words that come out of my mouth to land on hearts that are ready to receive it. God, thank you for the words you've given me. God, I just pray that you would uh, help me to work in your strength now. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so in this story, there's three main characters that I want to focus in on, okay? There's uh, Jairus, there's the woman, and there's Jesus, okay? And what I want to do in the beginning part of the sermon is I want us to get to the place where we are emotionally attached to the characters in the story, okay? I'd like for us to kind of dive in emotionally, place ourselves in where they would be uh, emotionally and what they're dealing with um, at this time. I want to be careful in saying that. I want you to understand, the Bible is not about us. It's about Jesus, okay? So when I say I want you to place yourself in this, I'm not saying that I want to make you the hero of the story, okay? It's not what I'm saying. Jesus is the hero of the story, hands down, period, okay? But I want us to emotionally understand that this isn't just some far distant story that we're reading like the Indian in the cupboard, okay? It's like the only book I know of from my growing up. Charlotte's Web, you know what I mean? Like, okay, that's it, okay? This isn't some distant character in a story. These are real people. These are real people. They have families, just like you and I do. They have jobs. They have expectations. They have goals, aspirations. They worry. They celebrate. These are real people. This isn't some distant story that we can see the beginning and the end of, and they lose their realness. I want us to understand these are real people. All right, so let's take a look at them. I'm going to start with Jairus. Okay, Jairus was a father. He had a family, had friends. He was a man of importance. The Bible in verse 22 says Jairus was one of the synagogue officials. He was a leader in the church. He was a ruler of the synagogue. Most likely, because he was a ruler in the synagogue, he did not have a positive view of Jesus. Okay, I want us to understand that this is kind of a little bit of an assumption, okay, but these are the type officials that led the persecution of Jesus, okay? I'm not saying that Jairus did that. I'm saying that this type, this is what the mentality of what the synagogue officials would be like, okay? The door to the church house would be closed to Jesus. He would be telling people, hey, listen, I have, I have influence on you. Stay away from this guy, okay? But something happens whenever we come into a place of need, doesn't it? Jairus was a man who had to put his prejudices aside. In the midst of his need, he recognized who he needed, and he recognized who his daughter needed. He had to lay aside what he had previously believed and reach for something new. Jairus was a man who lost all dignity. The Bible says he flung himself at the feet of Jesus. He flung himself at the feet of Jesus. Imagine this, y'all. Imagine. Get, get in the headspace of this community where you've got someone who's a, a leader in the church, a leader, and, and this person possibly is even saying negative things about Jesus, okay, this, this, you know, this leader, okay, and then all of a sudden there's a shift and we see this leader fall at the feet of Jesus. Surely he got to the place where his need was so great he lost all dignity and fell at the feet of Jesus and asked for help. Jesus was a man, I'm sorry, Jairus was a man 
who didn't let pride stand in the way. How many of us, especially men, let pride stand in the way when we're in desperate need of something, we won't say a word? We won't say a word. Y'all remember Jeff Foxworthy? You might be a redneck. Yeah, for all you young people, like this was like a really great comedian back in the day, okay? You might be a redneck if he was talking about my family, okay? Okay? Jeff Foxworthy had a bit in his, uh, excuse me, in his bit, he, uh, he talked about how a man can cut off his leg with a chainsaw and be hopping on one, one foot and say, I'm good, I'm good, I got it, I got it, okay? How many of us are in that position? How many of us are thinking right now, man, if they really knew the spot I was in, we are sitting there hopping on one foot, our world is crumbling all around us, and we just will, we, the pride will not let us ask for help. Can I tell you this? I want to say this in encouragement, okay? Your way, if it's in your hands, it's not better than God's way. You got to put it in the, in the hands of the Father, the one who's waiting to save. He's wanting to, to act. He's wanting to place it in his hands. Jairus had to have a shift in his perspective of Jesus. All right, let's look at character two, the woman. Woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Same age as the little daughter that's, that's on her deathbed. Since she's been alive, this woman has had this issue. In these days, the Levitical law, the law of the time, would say that she is unclean. And that if anybody touched her, that they would become unclean. What's the big deal about being unclean? Okay, so like my son just went to kids camp. Some of you have middle schoolers who are about to leave for camp tomorrow. Okay, my son came back, hadn't brushed his teeth all week long. Okay, he took full advantage of no one saying, hey, go brush your teeth. Some of you have middle schoolers. Their suitcase is gonna be completely different. You might as well throw it away when they come home, okay? What's the, what's, the, what's the big deal about being unclean? In these days, when they're talking about being unclean, what they're saying, y'all, is that they, they can't have a relationship with anybody. They're completely lonely. They can't, they can't go to church. They can't worship God. They can't, um, there is no relationship. They can't go to a family function. They are shoved to the shadows because of their problem, because of her issue. She was subbed to the shadows. She was broke. The Bible says that she had spent all she had on doctors trying to figure out the cure for her misery, but nothing worked. She just kept getting worse. Okay, y'all. Can you imagine what this poor lady's going through? 12 years of bleeding, 12 years of being considered unclean, 12 years of saving up money to try another treatment just to be disappointed, 12 years of every time you walk down the street, shopping for food, going through daily tasks, people avoiding you at all costs. 12 years. Are you there? Emotionally, are you there? Are you thinking about it? But then the Bible says something very interesting, y'all. It says that she heard about a man named Jesus. Verse 27 says, after hearing about Jesus, I can't express more emphatically the importance of us talking about Jesus, the importance of us telling our testimony about what he has done. The song that they just sang, I've witnessed it. I'll tell my family. I'll tell my nation. I'll tell my city. I'll tell my coworkers. I'm telling everybody. It is so important that we do that because just hearing about Jesus led this lady to a place of faith. It says that she, after hearing him, she went to him. She was at her wit's end. I've tried this, I've tried that. If this man can do what I've heard that he can do, maybe, just maybe, I might be healed. She took a risk. Think about this. The crowd was pushing in on Jesus. Y'all remember a few weeks ago when Hux put that picture up of that tennis player and all those people were crowded? Y'all remember that? Okay, get this image in your head. People are crowding around Jesus, okay, and she's having unclean, having to weave in and out of this crowd to try to get close enough to Jesus to touch his cloak. What if someone recognized her? 
What if they called her out? Remember, this isn't an unknown person. They know her to be unclean because she's been there 12 years. She could have been punished by the authorities. What if it didn't work? She took a risk. Are you at your wit's end? Have you tried all that you know to do? What are you willing to risk? She experienced healing. The Bible says that she could immediately tell that she was healed. She encountered Jesus. I don't have time to really dive into all of this. This is a lot of verses, okay? So I've got to skim through some stuff that I really wish that we could just dig in. Unclean. Levitical law says this lady's unclean. Jesus is perfection. The epitome of clean. And she reaches out and touches. She could have... She could have been expecting a reprimand, but what she encountered was redemption. Jesus reinstates her before the people because he calls her daughter. I really wish we could dig in on this, y'all. I really do. The fact that he turned to her and he called her daughter and he said, your faith has brought you healing. Go and be healed. He literally handed her life back to her in those words because it was before the crowd. Everybody that knew her to be unclean, she's now been healed. Okay, let's jump back to Jairus for a minute, because y'all done forgot about Jairus, okay? Y'all done forgot about him. What's Jairus thinking right now? What do you think he's thinking? Where's his mindset? His daughter's close to death, y'all. He... He dropped his pride. He's done what he's supposed to do. He fell at the feet of Jesus. I need your help, please. Jesus says, okay, they're on their way. And here we have all this crowd of people slowing Jesus down. We have all this crowd pressing in on him, slowing him down. Jairus has an emergency. He's pleaded with Jesus to come help. Jesus has agreed. Now the crowd is slowing him up. Then he turns around and what's Jesus doing? He's talking to an outcast. What is going on? Get out of the way, people. I need help. He's here to help me. Get out of the way. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you talking to her? We got to go. And then the news comes that it's too late, that his daughter is dead, and there's no need to bother the teacher anymore. Jesus overhears this, and he meets Jairus in the midst of his breaking, and he says, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. What? Jesus is saying to Jairus, I know what you're feeling. Don't lose hope. I recognize everything for you to come to me. I recognize what you had to do. I know what you have risked. I know the pride you've had to lay down. I know what you thought of me before. I know what others are thinking right now. You haven't lost importance in my eyes. You are still worth my effort. Stop worrying, Jairus. You're still important to me. Just hang on. We've gone from a level five miracle to a level 10. Just wait and see what I'm about to do. Don't be afraid. Keep believing. And we read on in the rest of the story where he goes to the house and he grabs the daughter by the hand, and he raises her up from the dead. And, we, and he, Jairus witnesses the level 10 miracle. He was expecting this or hoping for this, and he received this. So just a few points. Are y'all there? Emotionally, are you there? Okay. A few points I want to get across, okay? Point number one, God's delay isn't God's denial. If we believe what the Bible says about God, when we receive the word no or wait, we have to believe and know that it's either for our good or his glory. We have to know that it's for our good or for his glory. Sid mentioned last week in his sermon that we don't like the word no very much. Anybody with me? I don't like it. Y'all with me? Like three people? Okay. Um, 
Sometimes the word, the word no, it feels like a denial. When my son asks me if we can go fishing or if we can go down to the basketball courts and shoot basketball, and I tell him maybe or let's see or let's wait to see what the weather, um, watch the weather, see how it's going. And, and this time of year, I'm praying for rain because I do not want to go down and shoot basketball in 98 degree weather. If the answer ends up being no or wait or not yet, let's wait and see, it's, it's because he can't see what I see. He doesn't know what I know. And it may feel like a denial of him as my son, but it's not. If, if I said yes all the time, I would be raising a spoiled little boy, okay, who would become the shell of the man he's supposed to be because he's always gotten his way. And the reality of it is, is if I said yes to everything, what if those things that I'm saying yes to are the very things that are taking his eyes off of Jesus, that are taking his eyes and his focus off the things that are putting him in the place of reliance on the Lord? Where does faith ever get built if the answer is always yes. Jesus wants you, he wants me. He wants our attention, he wants our affection, he wants our everything. And sometimes in the midst of a delay, it feels like a denial. I'll, listen, I've been there, I know, but it's not. He proved his love for us by the finished work of the cross, amen? amen. Point number two, God's delay is not his punishment, it's preparation. The Bible is full of stories of promises made and then a waiting period. And then in that waiting period, there being challenges that are experienced. But in those challenges, there's preparing that's happening. Let's look at a couple. Abraham and Sarah, very beginning of the Bible, right? Or towards the front of the Bible, I should say. Abraham and Sarah are promised numerous descendants and a great nation. They had a waiting period of 25 years. The challenges they had in that time was Sarah's barrenness and their old age. Remember, they attempted to fulfill God's promise through Hagar. Y'all remember that? And then that was the birth of Ishmael, okay? Hey, listen, if you really dig in on that subject for just a minute, you'll understand that we are still, still, from the beginning of the Bible, we are still today feeling the effects of that decision. How did God prepare them through those challenges? They learned to trust God's timing and his power through the birth of Isaac. They grew in faith, and we know that they grew in faith because Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac when God called him to. So look at Joseph. He was promised in dreams of leadership and greatness. He had to wait about, a, about 13 years. During that 13 years, he was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and imprisoned. He had years of unjust imprisonment. But what did God do during that time? He developed humility, integrity, resilience. He gained administrative skills. He gained the wisdom that prepared him to be able to manage Egypt during a famine. Moses. God called him to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. 40 years of a waiting period. Remember, he killed the Egyptian and he fled. Here's a man who was called to lead God's people, ended up living as a shepherd in Midian. Shepherd was a lowly, lowly job, y'all, okay? Called to lead, living as a shepherd. What did God teach him during that time? He taught him humility and patience, gained a deeper relationship with God and understanding his ways better. Last one, David. There's many more, by the way. Just had to cut it down. David uh, promised, he was, the, he was the anointed king of Israel by Samuel. 15 years go by. He's persecuted by King Saul. He lived as a fugitive. He, was fa he faced betrayal and isolation. He fought various battles. He developed leadership skills and reliance on God and strengthened his faith and character through those trials. If you find yourself in a place where you feel like God is delayed, there's something going on, I want you to ask yourself three questions. First question, what is God teaching me? What is God teaching me? 
Stop stomping your feet and pouting. What is God teaching me in this moment? Second question, how is he moving around me? Can you see the things that he's doing, the people that he's placing in your life, the people that he's taking out of your life, the events that are happening? Can you see the things that he's doing around you? Are you looking for them? Third question, I think probably this is the most important question, is what I'm wanting for my desire or for his glory? Is what I'm wanting for my desire or his glory? Y'all, some of us have more faith in a water heater than we do our Jesus. Let that sink in for a second. You go turn on the shower, put it on hot water. Is it hot? It ain't hot. Maybe if y'all got those fancy, fancy uh, water systems, but in my house, it's cold. And you got to what? You got to what? You got to wait. But we sit there in faith, right? We know it's going to get warm. We know it's going to get hot. And some of us put more, we have more faith in the water heater than we do the creator of the universe. Surely he is more reliable than a hot water heater. We have to come to a place, though, where his glory is more important than our comfort, where his glory is more important than our agenda, where his glory is more important than anything in our life. As Hux would say, our story must be wrapped up in his glory, in God's glory. Our story should be wrapped up in God's glory. Our goal should be that we are reflecting who Jesus is in every aspect of our life. Let's look at the last point, God's delay, God's glory. Let's look at the last character, the most important character, Jesus. Number one, Jesus is full of compassion. He took the time to stop and care for the woman with the issue of blood, even though he was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. Jesus had patience. He did not rush or become frustrated by the interruption. He remained calm and patient. Jesus had faith in God's timing. He reassured Jairus in the midst of a hopeless situation. Hey, hang on. Keep your faith. Jesus prioritized people over tasks. Over and over and over again in God's word, we see that Jesus prioritized people over our agenda. People over agenda. People over agenda. Number five, Jesus was engaged and attentive. He was attentive to the woman's touch and took the time to listen to her story, showing that he cared. Okay, we're coming to the end. I want us to listen to the lessons that we should be doing. This is how we should be living with people. Guys, listen, if we're followers of Christ, we should be compassionate. We should be living life full of compassion. We should be living a life full of patience, especially with those who do not know Jesus. We should be living a life that's full of, of faith, knowing that God is working, God is doing what he needs to do. He hasn't forgotten us. We definitely should be prioritizing people over tasks. And I know, I know, this is a really hard one because sometimes we walk through life and we have these, these blinders on and we have our agenda, our goals, our, the things we need to get done. I think what Jesus wants us to do when we're following him is do this and see what's around us and take a moment when you see someone hurting or someone who needs encouragement When's the last time you spent time with someone that you're not getting anything back from? That there's not a, a business deal you're trying to make? Jesus was engaged. He was attentive to the people that were around him. Church family, I just want us to know And no matter your situation, if you're in the place where you're, maybe you're not in a delay, I want you to hear, God wants you to see people who are struggling. And God wants you to be the hands and feet of Jesus and be kind and be generous, be compassionate. And for those of you who are in the delay, as my family would say it, if it ain't good, God ain't done. 
Good doesn't mean it's always happy. Good doesn't mean it's always feels really good. But most of the time, if we find ourselves in a place where it's not feeling real good, it's because the mirror is pointed at us. Because in those moments where we're going through a delay and we're going through a time of doubt, a time of, man, why? God, I'm in an emergency right now. Why am I not hearing from you? A lot of times we struggle in that because we're focused on self versus, hey, God, I'm in this delay right now. Praise God. I know you're doing something, and I know that whatever it is is going to bring you more glory, and God, I just want to be a part of it. I just want to be a part of it. It's not about me, Lord. When I surrender to you, I took myself off the throne and I put you there. It's all about you. It's not about me. And what I say to people will not be about me. It'll be about you. And when I see the victory, I will boast in you and not me. Would our prayer be, would the life that we live may it look like, would it ever look like that we become less and he become great? One of the things I pray up here all the time before we lead worship on Sundays is that we would fade to the background and that, God, you would take, you would take the stage and it would be about you and that hearts would be led to you. If you're in the midst of a delay, I just want to tell you, it's not God's denial. God's delay is God's preparation. Don't try to eat the cake before it's baked, y'all. If you're in that delay, let him prepare it the way it needs to be prepared so that when you enjoy what he's doing, you get it to the fullest. God's delay is for God's glory. And if we will live that way, mm, what people will see, they will see lives that have been radically changed by the gospel just reflecting God's glory. Yeah, we've been through this, but man, praise God, look what he did through it. Yeah, my, my husband hasn't come to church in a long time. I'm gonna continue to pray for him because I know God's doing something in his life. My wife has scars after scars after scars from her past, but sometimes it makes it really difficult to love her the way that she needs to be loved, but God, I know you're doing something. My kid's running from you, God. Praise God, I know you're going to do something. You're building a testimony in them. God, I can't find the right job. But I know you're doing something. You're bringing people in my life. I know you are because you're a good God. You're a good God. Could we live our life like this? I, I own a pool business. If you don't know, I'm not trying to promote the pool business. I won't be accepting any new customers right now. But I tell uh, the girl who works for me, I tell her this all the time. We live like this. We live like this. God, bring the customers you want us to have. Take away the customers you don't want us to have. Bring the people who work for us. Take them the ones you don't want us to have. This is the way we're living. Les and I are going to live like this with everything in our life, including our kids, our finances. And it's hard, y'all. Sometimes we want to do this and hold on. Okay? But if we live like this, he can take what he wants, he can bring what he wants, no matter what, to God be the glory. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, listen, there's tons of people here who would love to walk you through that process. It is the very best decision I've ever made. It's not always easy. I don't get it all the time. I can't imagine where I would be without him. Jesus isn't some storybook figure that's made up. He's a real person. He's a real God. He died on a real cross. And three days later, he really did raise again and conquered death on our behalf. I just invite you to, to take that step and walk with the Lord. Surrender your life to him. It won't always be an easy decision, but it will be the best decision you've ever made. Can we pray together? Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity that we've had to come and to 
to uh, read your word, to sing songs about you, to sing songs to you. God, I pray for those who might be um, just experiencing a real delay right now. God, that maybe they've been praying for a really long time. And God, it just seems like there hasn't been an answer. God, I pray that maybe today they would hear from you. That as I believe that you felt about Jairus telling them to hang on, that they're still important, that they haven't lost any position with you. And God, for those of us who have given up on, a certain, on certain things, God, may we have a fire ignited in us to continue to pray, to continue to come to the one who saves. For those of us who are letting pride stand in the way, God, may we drop our pride and follow you the way we should. God, help us to be patient with people. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to always put people above our agendas. And God, as a church family, God, I pray, Lord, that we would just love people well. Those who are broken, those who are lost and don't even know it, those who are really hard to love, those who carry scars. God, that we would just do a really good job at loving those people in your name. God, whatever delay we have going on right now or ones that will come, God, I pray that your glory would be reflected in how we respond to it. Be with us now, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.